<laughs> hey, uh, turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to pick up in chapter 8. Of course, we're in chapter 9 this morning, but there's some verses I'm going to cover real quickly as we uh, set the context here. 1 Corinthians, I don't think I put that in there, did I? That's okay. They can follow along. They have Bibles. I think they all have Bibles, right? Who does not have a Bible? We can get you one if you don't have one. There should be one right in front of you in the pew. And uh, if you don't own one, just take that and claim it as yours. Take it home with you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7. However, not all men have this knowledge. This knowledge, this understanding. Because the issue here was that there were certain people in the church had taken issue with eating meat sacrificed to idols. Why? Because that's what they had been doing. Uh, they were buying meat to, that had been sacrificed to idols because it had been sacrificed to idols. They, it was an act of worship for them. And that's what Paul goes on to say. Not all men have this knowledge, but some being accustomed to idols, <clears throat> I'm sorry, until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to, to an idol, and their conscience being defiled or being weak is defiled. So, Paul's uh, claim here, there's nothing, and he'll go on to reiterate this as we continue on, that there's nothing wrong with eating meat, whether it had been sacrificed to an idol or not, unless you're doing it as an act of worship. And there's some believers within the church who used to worship idols, and they ate the meat for that purpose. Now, the reason Christians were buying meat is because it was dirt cheap. <laughs> because, what, it, because it had been sacrificed to these idols up on a mount outside of Corinth. Uh, they would, they would, a portion of that meat would be uh, burned or consumed on the idol. Another portion, portion would be given to the priest. And the rest would be taken down to the place called the Shambles, which is basically an open-air market. And they'd sell the meat. And it was a very cheap price. It was really good meat. At a cheap price. So the Christians were buying this meat. Not because it had been sacrificed to an idol, but because it was cheap. But the issue here is that, you know, if I invited you over to dinner and you guys were in the habit of eating meat because it had been sacrificed to idols and you're new believers, it would cause you it could cause you to stumble. Well, you know, Pastor Brian's eating this meat. Obviously there's nothing wrong with worshiping these idols. That was the attitude they were taking. I wasn't worshiping an idol when I invited you over to dinner, but they were eating it because it was worship titles, you see. But there was also saying, there were also those, we can't eat that. We're, you know, our conscience is being defiled here because it's been sacrificed to idols. That's the issue. That's the context as we continue on here. Picking up verse 8. But food will not, be, will not commend us to God. Nothing we eat is going to make us right before God, is what he's saying. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. It makes no difference in the world. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. The weak is the religious person, right? The weak who is the one who, with all these lists of do's and don'ts, they're not necessarily following the Spirit of God. They're following rules, rites, and rituals, and regulations. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, that is, you who have knowledge, you realize that, hey, there's nothing wrong with eat, me, eating meat to an idol offered to, because it's just meat. That's all it is to me. Let's say that um, you go into a casino, right? And uh, I'm using this as an illustration because it's a fresh in my mind because Heath is going to work at a casino. But the, the issue is, I go to a casino. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not trying, I'm not one who's in the money. I'm just going there for the entertainment, right? But there's a brother who has a gambling problem, sees his pastor go into a casino and putting money into a slot machine, and he's going to say, man, there's nothing wrong with, you know, gambling. And he gets caught up. He gets consumed in gambling once more, and he loses everything he has because he's trying to get rich. That's, that's the idea here. I don't want someone to stumble. I don't want someone to lose everything they've gained because they have a, a habitual problem, you see. We don't want that to happen. That's what Paul's saying here. He goes on to say, 
He who has knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, if he has a gambling problem, if he has a drinking problem, if he has a, a sexual problem, that, you know, your meat, name your meat here. If he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols. For through your knowledge, he who is weak is ruined. He's lost everything. He's lost everything he's gained in Christ because of your your ability, your freedom. You don't want that to happen. And so, by sinning against the brethren and wounding the his, wounding their conscience when he is weak, you sin against Christ. If you call somebody else to stumble, you're sinning against Christ. You may have the freedom to do whatever it is that you do. You may your your conscience may be completely clean, but if you're doing it as someone who has a problem with that. That, that substance or with that liberty, then you're sinning against Christ. Therefore, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. I don't want, I don't want my brother to stumble. So I'm going to, although I have this freedom, I'm going to sacrifice that freedom for the sake of a brother. Paul wrote in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, he says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit. Do, don't do anything for yourself. Don't be focused upon what you can gain, what you can benefit from. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Jesus had said, he's, or, or John wrote, he says, there's no greater love than this, that one lay down his life or his liberties for his brother. No greater love than this. Love your brother. Consider him more important than yourselves. Because we're talking about souls here. We're talking about saving souls. That's the context as we continue on here. Paul writes, Am I not free? Now, anytime, the principle that we're going to learn here as we go through 1 Corinthians especially, Paul will ask questions. And keep in mind, when, with, with exception of one part here, and we'll get into that, I think it's verses 9 and 10, with the exception of verses 9 and 10 in this chapter, anytime Paul asks a question in the negative, that is, am I not the negative free, the answer is always the positive, yes. Now when he asks a question in the positive, the answer is always in the negative, no. So when he asks a negative question, the answer is always yes in the positive. When he asks a a positive question, the answer is always in the negative, no. So keep that in mind. Am I not free? Paul, the answer is what? Yes, yes I'm free. <laughs> I have been set free. Have I, not seen our, have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Yes, we know that from the book of Acts. Are you not my work in the Lord? I've won you. I've established this church. I've brought you to Christ. Yes, that's the answer. If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you. For you are the, the, the seal, of the, that is, the, the evidence, the proof of my apostleship in the Lord. My defense, my argument. It's as if Paul's been stand on trial. There's people that's throwing these accusations at him. My defense. I'm, I'm bringing my, my actions to defense here. My defense to those who examine me is this. Do we not have a right to eat and drink? Yes. yes. I have a right to eat meat sacrificed to idols. I have the right to drink wine. I have the right to eat and drink whatever I want. The answer is yes. Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife? Yes, I have that right. I have the right to take along a believing wife. Because he, his wife apparently had died or she had divorced him. And so he says, I have a right to take along a believing wife. But why is he not doing this? Why does he not do this? Because he wants to be free. He doesn't want a wife, as he stated in the previous chapters, to be a hindrance that keeps him from spending as much time focused upon the gospel as possible. So he, he's, he has a right. Now, when you can't do nothing or do something, what do you do? You don't do it, right? If you can't. But if you have the ability to do something... And the freedom, you, what, you're exercising freedom. If you choose not to do it, if you can and don't, you're exercising liberty. You're exercising freedom. That's Paul's point. 
Some things I don't do even though I can do it. You know, I, so, you, know you might say, well, I have the freedom to go to the casinos and, and gamble with, with whoever I want. I have the freedom to drink alcohol. I have the freedom to smoke cigarettes. I have the freedom to do this. I have the freedom to do that. Yes, you have that freedom. But why should you not do those things? For the sake of others. You're considering everyone else around you is more important than yourselves. I, I love cigarette smoking. I love it, man. I love it. If, but I don't do it. Why? Because as a pastor, if I sit here and preach, man, you can stop doing this, that, or the other. You will look at me and say, well, why don't you quit smoking? So what have I done? I've taken smoking off the table. I have the freedom to smoke if I want to smoke, but I don't smoke. So I've taken it off the table. Why? For the love of you guys. For the love of the, of the brethren. Therefore, Paul goes on to say, see, this is his argument. And the rest of the... Let's uh, back up. <laughs> Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, even as the rest of the apostles and the brothers of the Lord Cephas... Peter, James, and John take along a believing wife. Can I, I have that right too? Or is it just them? Do, do they have certain rights that I don't have? No, the answer is no. They have that right, they have the liberty, and they've chosen to do so. But they're exercising their right and their liberty. Or do, do only Barnabas and I not have a right to refrain from working? Yes, they do have the right to refrain from working. But they choose not to. Paul was a, a tent maker, and he's going to give into the reasons why he continued to work while ministering to the church. He's going to give them those reasons in just a moment. Who at any time serves as a soldier at his own expense? When I joined the Air Force, when Ronnie joined the Marines, when uh, Matt joined the Navy, they gave us our uniforms, they gave us our rifles, they gave us our armor. They paid us, they moved us from point A to point B at their expense. The military did it at their expense. We didn't have to pay anything. In fact, they paid us to serve in the military. They met our needs by giving us a paycheck, and they, we got an all-expense-paid trips around the world <laughs> at, the, at the expense of the military. And so the government's not coming, going to come down and says, I want you to serve, and by the way, you've got to pay for everything. They're not going to do that. If the government calls you, if the government compels you, they're going to equip you. They're going to equip you for the work of service. And God does the same thing. He equips us for the work of service. And continuing on, sometimes, we'll get into that in just a moment. Don't want to jump ahead of myself. <laughs> Who plants a vineyard? i got a small vineyard out in my backyard, by the way. And does not eat the fruit of it. I got, you know, I've got some apple trees. I've got, some, I've got a cherry tree. I've got a plum trees. I've got peach trees. I've got grapes. I've got blue, blackberries, blueberry, raspberry. And, and when, the, when those, those, that fruit begins to grow, I don't say to them, no, 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 no. We're going to sell that at the market. You can't eat that. Who does that? No, you're going, to, you're going to grow something. You're going to have some fruit. You're going to eat that fruit, right? If you can beat the squirrels, do it, and the rabbits, <laughs> and the birds. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> good. I like that idea. There's been times this old man, that blackberry, is sitting right there, and it's just, it's just about there. I'm going to give it one more day, just one more day. Oh, it's going to be so good. I go out there, and it's gone because the, the, the varmints have gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> I miss the weed eater. Oh, yeah, the weed eater. <laughs> oh, Ronnie did that too, by the way. The same tree, by the way. <laughs> so, have you guys got something against my trees out there? <laughs> oh. I'm not speaking these things according to human judgment, am I? Answer? That's, that's one of them. <laughs> that's one of the verses that we were talking about. There are a couple exceptions, and the answer would be no. Or does not the law say these things? Yes, for it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. 
God is not concerned about oxen, is he? No, he's pointing to something greater. If someone's working, if someone's laboring, he deserves to reap the benefits of his labor, of his work. Or is he speaking altogether for our sakes? Yes, for our sake. It was written. Because the plowman ought to plow in hope. In hope. Now, hope is not like a wish. Boy, I sure hope to go to the Kansas City Chiefs game and, and to see them you know, in the Super Bowl. I hope. That's, a, that's like saying, I wish. I wish this could happen. A hope and a wish is two different things. A hope is not like, boy, I wish this was happening. A hope is the, exe- or the uh, absolute expectation of a coming good. It's the expectation of a coming good. In the first couple of years when I planted my trees in, in my vineyard back there, I had a little bit of fruit, a little bit of fruit here, a little bit of fruit there. You know what that little bit of fruit gave me? Hope of a greater amount of fruit. So there's an expectation of a greater good. You know it's going to happen because you got a little bit of evidence right here, right now. So we are to plow in hope. As we labor, God is going to bless us. With a little bit here, with a little bit there, because there's a greater hope coming. He's saying, hey, here, here's, here's a lay on payment, if you will. And the, the, the thresher to thresh in hope of sharing the crops. If we sold spiritual things to you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? What is he saying there? He's saying, if I share the gospel with you, no, I should get paid. I should, my, my needs should be met. There should be some compensation here. Because I've devoted my life to this. There should be some sort of compensation coming back. And that's what he will go on to say later on. Uh, verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaimed the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Those who pro- share the gospel, should get their living from the gospel. Now, Paul was choosing not to get paid. And he's going to get into the reason why here in just a moment. Well, let's go ahead and get into that reason. <laughs> Amen. So, so, if others share the right over you, do we not more? Nevertheless, we did not use this right. We had the right to receive financial compensation from you. But we did not exercise this right. Right? You hear that? But we endured all things so that we would cause no hindrance in the gospel of Christ. Paul says, I had a right to receive financial compensation from you, but I did not exercise that financial compensation, the right to receive that or to ask for it. He even had the right to ask for financial compensation, but he chose not to. Why? Because he didn't want it to be a hindrance to the gospel. One of the problems that was happening in that day is the same problem that's happening in this day. They had some people that were taking advantage of the gospel. Taking advantage of people by proclaiming the gospel. And they were ripping people off. They were taking scripture and twisting it so they could get more and more and more money. They were using the pulpit to pound and say, Give me more money and God will bless you. They were abusing that. Same thing that happens with the TV evangelists today. Paul says, hey, this is a problem. I'm going to take it off the table because I don't want to hinder these people. I want to bless these people. Now, there's some of us, like Glenn, myself, Tammy. Tammy's here 30, 40 hours a week sometimes. She doesn't see, receive financial compensation. Why? Because we don't necessarily need it. And she'd rather serve. She doesn't want to make that an issue. The church is not bringing enough money in to pay her, so she chooses it to do it because she loves the Lord. That's why she does it. Now, here's the deal. Paul is drawing this information out in the here and now because they're more mature. And previously, they, he didn't make it an issue because they were young in their faith. But now, one of the points that he's making here, hey, you guys are learning, you're growing, you should be getting deeper and deeper into Scripture. It's time for you boys and girls to grow up. You know, you should know the benefits of, re- or to, of giving. And that's one of the things he'll get into in chapter 11, the benefits to giving. But 
And, and, and I'll do that too. I'll go ahead and wait off to that in, in a moment. Well, hey, no, let's go ahead. Turn with me to Haggai. Sometimes we're missing the blessing of a church, as a church. Paul talks, I'm sorry, the Haggai, the prophet Haggai talks about these things. Sometimes we're, we're working and we're laboring and, we're, and we're, we're trying to get ahead and we just can't seem to get ahead. Why? Well, God gives us the answer here in the book of Haggai. He says, this, uh, pick up verse 3. Have I given you a chance to get there? No, that's okay. You guys read along with me. Haggai chapter 1, verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in paneled housings? Houses? So the paneled houses wasn't just something of the 50s, 60s, or 70s. Paneled houses goes all the way back into the times of iniquity. Iniquity. Equity. (laughs) Equity. Old days, all the ways back to the times of Moses, it goes back. Antiquity, that's the word I'm trying to come up with, antiquity. Uh, Is it time for yourselves to dwell in paneled houses while this house lies desolate? God had set them free from Babylonian captivity. And they go all the way back to Israel. They had all kinds of excitement in the air. We're going to rebuild the temple but then hard times came, tough times came. There was, there was a bickering and backbiting, quarreling within, and there were these attacks from the outside. They laid the foundation for the temple. And then they decided it was time to build their own houses. Here lies the Lord's house in desolation, and now they're working on their own houses. He says, Now, therefore, thus said us the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Hey, listen to what? Consider your ways. Look back on what's happening to you right now. Consider your ways. Consider where your priorities are. Considering where your heart is. Consider that. Consider your ways. You have sown much. You've sown a lot. But you harvest little. Why? You're sowing much. But you harvest little. You eat, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You're eating. You, you got food on your plate, but it's not filling your belly. Why are you not satisfied? Because there's always, you know, we're always trying to satisfy our souls, but we're putting the wrong things into us to satisfy our souls. Our priorities are messed up. He says, but there's not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there's not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. He who earns, earns wages put into a purse with holes. How many have done that? You work and you labor, you put in all these hours, and you're putting your money into your purse, but it's like when you reach your hand in your purse, there's no money there. It's like, man, where did all my money go? Where's all my hard-earned money gone? I'm working, I'm laboring, but there's nothing in my purse. I've been there. (laughs) <laughs> I had a man purse. <laughs> yeah, a fanny pack. <laughs> now, the Lord's going to answer, or answer the questions again. Thus says the Lord, consider your ways. Okay, you don't have any money. You're working, you're laboring, you're striving and straining to earn, but you don't have any money. Well, just consider your ways. Consider your priorities. Where's your heart? Where's your focus? Go up to the mountains, bring wood, and rebuild the temple. Then I may be pleased with it and be glorified, says the Lord. Here's, the, here's what I want you to do. First of all, what's your priorities here? And let me help you correct your priorities. Go up to the mountain, get some wood, and come back down and rebuild my temple. Rebuild my house, says the Lord. You look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home... When you bring it home, I blow it away. Where's your money? I've blown it away. Now, isn't it our money that is interested in? 
No, it's our hearts. It's our priorities. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. Why does the Lord want them focused upon his house? But what, what happens in the house? Relationship, worship. That's what he's wanting. He wants our hearts. So he's saying, make me the priority. The reason you're empty is because what you're seeking is never going to satisfy you. What's going to satisfy you is a relationship with me. Get your priorities straight, and I'll let you have some money. I'll let you have a good time. Is it, because he doesn't want us anchored into this world. He doesn't want us cleaning to material stuff. But he, Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all this other stuff will be added to you when you get your priorities straight. You got to get your priorities straight before you can be blessed. Do what? <laughs> Amen. De why, declares the Lord of hosts, because my house which lies there, therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew. It's not raining because of you. Isaiah prayed. He says, I'm going to pray that the Lord would, st would stop the rain. And he prayed, and it stopped raining for seven years. And Isaiah said, okay, now you got your priorities straight. I'm going to petition the Lord, excuse me, to pray. And he prayed again, and the rain began to fall. Was it Isaiah or Elijah? Was it Isaiah? Okay. I called for the drought on the land. You feeling distant and dry? You feel like there's a drought in your life? In your life? It's because God has called for the drought. Why? Because he wants your attention. He wants your focus. He wants you. On the grain, the new wine, on the oil, on the ground, the produce, on men, on cattle, and all the labor of your hands. Listen to what he writes in Malachi. He says, Will a man rob God? He opens up the question. Will a man rob God? I, Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, if you're looking for it. Will a man rob God? Yet you're robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? God, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You don't know what a tithe is? A tithe is simply 10%. It's 10% of your income. And so what God is saying, 10% of your income belongs to me. And we'll get into, again, again, the reason why here. He said it belongs to me. So if you want to have more, then stop robbing God. That's what he goes on to say here. In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. You're cursed because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me on this. You remember what Jesus said to Satan? You shall not test the Lord God. But there is, there's only one place, one area in which God says, test me. And it's in giving. You give to me. Test me. Put me to the test on this. Put me to the test on this. He said, test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you blessings until it overflows. If you test me on this, if you give me what I'm asking you, I will bless your socks off. But you've got to get your priorities straight. Then I will rebuke the devourer. That, you know, that person that keep, you're putting your money in the pocket here, and it keeps falling. He said, I will rebuke that. You will have money in your pocket. Amen. <laughs> I will too. Uh, so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the fields cast its grapes. My, my, one of my trees has been casting its fruit. Maybe it's because, well, we'll just test the Lord on that. Says the Lord of hosts, all the nations of you will be blessed. All the nations, everyone around you. Everyone's going to look around and say, man, that Glenn, he's, he's blessed. You know, 
Tammy, man, she is blessed. If we're following the Lord, the Lord, everyone on the outside is going to be looking in and say, man, that guy is blessed. The Lord's blessing his socks off. Now, again, it's not your money that God wants. But Jesus says, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. If I'm investing in the stock market, guess what I'm going to be watching? Stock market, because that's where my treasure is. Now, if I move that, that treasure in the stock market to a business, guess, guess where my focus is going to be? On the business. God says, hey, give me 10% of your treasure. Guess where my heart is going to be? With Jesus, with God in heaven. That's where my focus is going to be. Now, Paul and I, you know, neither Glenn nor I or Tammy. Glenn's here as a pastor now. He's not getting paid. Tammy doesn't get paid. I don't get paid. Now, so, but I understand, I'm not saying this for my benefit. I will continue. To, here's the promise I'll make. I'll continue to work. My focus is not to quit working. I'm going to continue to work no matter what happens because I'm going to take these resources that come in and invest it in the church so the church will grow. So understand, I'm not saying that because Brian has a get-rich scheme plan here. That's not the idea. Paul goes on to explain this. Listen to what he says. Do you not know that those who pro perform sacred services eat food of the temple and those who attend regularly at the altar have their share of the altar? So those who are working in the temple... They eat from the temple. They, they get their clothing from the temple. That's where they are. That's where they're serving. That's where they... And so the Lord also said, directed, that those who proclaim their gospel is to get their living from the gospel. But I have used none of these things. Why? Because he doesn't want these young Christians to stumble. He doesn't want to make it an issue. So he chose to go build tents to take the issue off the table. And I'm not writing these things so that I will, it will be done in my case. I'm not looking at, I'm not saying these things so that you'll start paying me. No, he was wanting them to be blessed. For it would be better for me to die than to have any man to make my boast an empty one. He says, I'm boasting about this. I'm boasting. I want you guys to know I love the Lord so much I'm willing to work without getting paid. I'm boasting about this. For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of for I am under compulsion for compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. I can relate to that. I'd be a miserable man if I wasn't able to come up here in Sunday morning and preach the gospel. So I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be able to stand up here and preach the gospel. Woe is me if I don't get to preach. I'd be miserable. For if I do not, if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward. Where's the reward? In heaven. There's a greater reward laid up for me in heaven. When I get to heaven, I can say, Lord, I continue to do this because I wanted to bless you and I wanted to see more souls saved. So I can boast about that. I have a reward coming. Now, now, he goes on to say, if I have a reward, but if I, against my will, I have a stewardship. He said, even if I am getting paid here, I still have a stewardship here. God's given me this stewardship. He says, I don't have other alternative motives here. I have no other motive but to proclaim the gospel. Now, and he could boast about that because he's not getting paid. There he's saying, where's my motive? So that was even a greater authority to say, man, there's something waiting for me. There's something great in heaven waiting for me. So that he had authority there because he didn't get paid. Did he have a right to get paid? Yes. Would anybody hold it against him? Probably not at this point. If he did. What then is my reward that the, when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so that as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. I've got to say something here so that I do get some sort of compensation. I live in this house back here, rent-free and utility. So I wanted to let you guys know that, you know, yes, I do get some sort of comp compensation here. Amen. <laughs> then when I preached the gospel, I didn't want to be deceptive here. That's why I pointed it out. I realized, hey, I do get some sort of compensation. For though I am free of all men... 
He said, I'm free of all men. See, because if, if men were paying him, then he's obligated to men. He says, but I'm free. But at the same time, I have made myself a slave to all men, that I may win more. His focus is upon winning souls. He wanted to see more people saved. He wanted souls to be saved. That was his motive. And he'll get into that in just a minute as we go deeper. To the Jews, I became a, as a Jew. What is he saying here? Because he didn't want... He'd, when Timothy... Uh, he was going to take Timothy, who was a Gentile. He was going to take him into the temple. But before he could take him into the temple, Timothy had to be a Jew. Because only Jews were allowed in the temple. Now, if you were a Gentile, you could become a Jew. How? By being circumcised. So Paul wanted to take Timothy into the temple. So he circumcised Timothy. Timothy didn't need to be circumcised in order to be saved. But Paul wanted to take an argument off the table. So he circumcised. Same way. I took an argument off the table when I stopped smoking. And whether I smoked or didn't, whether I did smoke or not smoke, it was not going to make any difference. I was going to heaven. But I wanted to take the argument off the table. Paul did the same thing with Timothy. He made Timothy a Jew. Not to so that Timothy would be saved, but to remove this argument. Why? Because he wanted to be able to communicate to Jews and win them for the sake of the gospel. Right, amen. So, but they're, they're thinking, how can you bring this Gentile into the temple? Well, let's make him a Jew so we can take him into the temple. So, but there was also another case, though, with the Galatians. The Galatians were Gentiles, Right? But these Jews, these converted Jews come in and say, Hey, man, if you're going to be saved, you've got to become a Jew like me. Paul says, No, no. You're saved right where you are. I don't want you to, to, to get circumcised thinking your salvation lies in circumcision. So there was a situation where circumcision was a case in point that someone needed to be circumcised. But there was another case in which they weren't. So there has to be a balance here. You've got to know when to argue, right? You guys are seeing this? Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, cool. So Paul says, to the Jew I become a Jew. When he went to the Jews, he ate Jewish food. He wouldn't eat catfish. He wouldn't eat rabbit. He wouldn't eat pork because he didn't want to, to defend the Jew. But when he went to the Gentile, guess what he did? He ate catfish. He ate rabbit. He ate pork. He whatever what he, what he wanted because... He didn't want to say, hey, your food's not good enough for me. So to the Jew, he became a Jew. To the Gentile, he became a Gentile. He removed all arguments. Why? Because he, he considered everyone else as more important than himself. He wanted to see people saved. To the weak. Who's the weak? The religious person. The one who has to have all these rules, rights, and rituals, and regulations. The ones who says, well, if you're going to go to this church, then you've got to put your hair up in a bun, you've got to wear a long dress. Paul says, well, okay, if I'm going to go to that church, I'm going to look like them, I'm going to act like them, I'm going to talk like them. I'm not going to make an issue of that. God has all these churches, and my Aunt Janice and I were just talking just a few minutes ago, every church in this town is here for a reason. I believe there's, there's Christians in every single church. And God has established each one of these church. Some for the weak, some for the strong. Someone, some people need rules, rights, and rituals and regulations so their conscience does not become defiled. Others have complete liberty. They can eat, and they can drink, they can do whatever they want in liberty. So Paul says to the weak, if I'm going to go to that church, I'm going to look like those people, I'm going to act like those people, I'm going to talk that, like those people. Why? So I can proclaim the gospel. So they can hear me when I proclaim the gospel. I have become all things to all men by all means and to save some. So that by all means I may save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel so that I become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? 
but only one receives the prize. Paul was a sports fan. I, mean, he, I could see him at the Olympic Games cheering on the Kansas City Chiefs. Oh, they weren't, they weren't there. But they, he, was, he was a sports fan, right? And so he's using these illustrations. Why? Because the Corinthians were sports fans. You know, he became a Corinthian. They were into sports. Paul says, hey, I can get into that. I like seeing these guys out there boxing and spearing and doing these things. He says, run in such a way that you may win. If you're going to enter the race, if you're going to enter the Christian race, then run so that you may win, so that you can be a partaker of the prize. Everyone who competes in the games exercises what? (laughs) Self-control. Self-control. You have the ability to exercise self-control. You can do it. Sometimes it's hard, but some, hey, you can do it. God, by the way of His Holy Spirit, has given you the ability to do whatever you, He asks you to do. They do it then to receive a perishable wreath. We, an imperishable. The wreath that they received was one that you know, was like an olive, uh, an olive branch, an olive, um, what do you call it? It was a wreath. <laughs> what would happen though, that wreath? In a couple of weeks, it was dead. It was dried up. It was gone. But you do it for an imperishable crown, an imperishable wreath. You're in this race. You're going to heaven, but there's a prize at the end. I want that bigger prize. And the race that we're running is not against other people, by the way. It's against ourselves. It's Brian against Brian. The Brian in the flesh, Brian in the spirit. There's, there's a flesh, there's a war that's going on within Brian. The natural man and the spiritual man. I want the spiritual man to win out. I want the spiritual man exercising control over the fleshly man. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating air. When I was boxing back in high school days, you know, we'd shadow box, Right? Not, he says, when I box, I want to hit something. <laughs> I want to I punch out that natural man that's within me. I want to knock him out, right? I want to deal with him. I discipline my body. If I'm going to be a boxer, I'm going to discipline my body. As a Christian man, I'm going to have exercise self-control over my body. I want to bring my body into subjection to the spirit. We're all created, spirit, soul, and body. The soul is lodged in between the spirit and the flesh. The spirit can only relate to the things of God. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The, the flesh, the body, can only relate to the things of this world. Physical, material things. Food, clothing, shelter, sex, drugs, rock and roll. You know, those type of things. The soul is lodged in the, in the between. I don't want the things of this world exercising control over my soul. I want the spirit exercising. So I'm going to bring the body in subjection to my soul. How? Through the relationship I have with God. That's how we get control over the flesh. To build that relationship with God. He says, but I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified. We don't. We don't, we're not working for our salvation. We were working for the reward. And, but what is the prize? Paul mentioned the prize. What is our prize? And it's eternal life, but there's a greater prize. We all have eternal life if we're saved. So we're going to heaven. But there's a prize that we're going to receive when we get to heaven. In the book of Colossians, Paul says, You are my prize. I want to win you. You are my reward. That's why Paul was doing what he did. That's why he gave up his liberties to have a wife, to eat meat, to drink wine. He gave up those liberties to win the greater prize. Amen? Let's uh, close with a word of prayer there. We'll pick up next week as we pick up in chapter 10. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the hope that you've given us of heaven. And Lord, we know that we're going to heaven, but we also know that there's a greater prize that lays up for us. 
and that is seeing souls saved. So, Lord, may we be focused upon you. May we consider those that's around us and their weaknesses, their, their frailties, and may we not let our liberties become a stumbling stone, an obstacle to seeing them saved. May we be willing to put those things aside so that we can see more people saved. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.